Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll discuss the latest in foreign affairs with former NATO Ambassador Kurt Volker, and we'll learn about the challenges faced by American Indian students in higher education. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Encouraging news on the health front, the rate of cardiovascular deaths in Arizona ranks among the top 20% of states according to a United Health Foundation report. The report, though, also showed some discouraging news. Arizona ranked 43rd for early childhood immunization and 49th for per capita public health funding. The past month has been a deadly reminder that attacks by the so-called Islamic State can take many forms and can happen as far from the Middle East as a holiday gathering in San Bernardino. Here to update how the fight against ISIS is shaping foreign affairs is Kurt Volker, former NATO ambassador and now director of ASU's McCain Institute. Good to see you again. Thanks, Ted. Great Thanks to Thanks for here. being here. My, oh, my. You've been, it's, the, you were here about a month ago, yep. and the Paris attacks hadn't happened. San Bernardino hadn't happened. All the, it's crazy times stop out there. having me back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, let's talk about the Paris attacks first here. The impact of those attacks yeah. on Europe. Yeah, it's huge. It's huge. There's been a lot of things that have come as a result of this. One of them is that uh, France had been seeking to overthrow Assad as part of changing Syria, dealing with the Syria crisis. Russia had come in, remember, on Assad's side in Syria. France has now flipped its position. It says it's more important for us to go after ISIS than it is to get rid of Assad. So we're going to actually work with Russia and work with Assad to see if we can get rid of ISIS. So that has flipped their position on that. On the refugees, uh, they keep coming to Europe. Uh, the last I heard in Sweden, it was like 6,000 a week registering in Sweden. They're on track for 2% of their population this year. Chancellor Merkel just today came out and said, we may have taken our fill. We're not sure we can take any more. So you're going to see a pushback on the refugee crisis as well. And you see Britain having a vote in Parliament to put their airplanes into bombing in Syria, not just in Iraq, uh, in order to go after ISIS. And you see even Germany willing to provide intelligence support to the French. So Europe has shifted a lot as a result of this. And politically, we're seeing, uh, I think the Conservatives won the second vote there in France, but the, the National Front there yes. in France did pretty well. And uh, in Poland, a lurch to the right in Absolutely. Poland. Absolutely. You're seeing publics in Europe, whether it's in Germany or Poland or France or the UK or Hungary, acting as though they believe their governments just don't get it, that we have refugees streaming in and we don't want them. We have terrorists attacking us and we're not prepared for that and we're not getting rid of the terrorists. Uh, the economy is still stagnating. We still have to bail out Greece and all those other things that we're doing. And the public have just had it. And uh, it particularly was in Germany where Merkel at one point said, we'll take all the refugees that, um, that we can. The public's just lost it. And they started doing things like burning her, her you know, figures of her, burning her in effigy, right. um, putting her in a casket as part of the protest in order to show how unhappy they were. This had never happened with her before in Germany. Uh, and I'd read that just recently that Italy was trying to work with Libya yes. on refugee. Good luck with working with right. them. Who do you work with in Libya? Exactly. You don't even have one government. You have competing governments in Libya. Plus, you have a lot of militias that control territory and will do just about anything for a profit and for guns. And you even have uh, an ISIS-affiliated group in the port of Sirte that says they're controlling that port. I can understand Italy's problem, though, because everyone's worried about the Syrian refugees, and a lot of them are coming across Turkey and the Balkans by foot, some of them by boat to Greece. Italy's got a problem with refugees or economic migrants coming from sub-Saharan Africa or North Africa through Libya, which is largely ungoverned. And they, where the European Union has said we can give asylum to refugees from a war zone, that doesn't apply to these economic migrants coming in Italy, and Italy's stuck with them. So. Europe, obviously, things are happening there, tense situation. U.S. foreign policy, we keep hearing from some sides saying we need to ramp up the military presence mm -hmm. over there. Other sides saying you do that, you're just basically recruiting efforts for ISIS, and who knows who you'd be fighting. You can't even tell the good guys from the bad. Uh, U.S. foreign policy, your thoughts? All right, we've got three major crises going on simultaneously now. Uh, we have the ISIS Middle East crisis from Libya through Syria and Iraq and to Iran and, and the nuclear issue. 
and may see Afghanistan getting worse again, mm -hmm. that, that whole arc. We've got Russia invading its neighbors, <laughs> annexing territory, threatening others, threatening nuclear weapons, doing all kinds of crazy stuff. We've got China building out the islands in the South China Sea and trying to militarize its claim to uh, this uh, air and sea space that it had not militarized before. And that is quite directly challenging us. And we had a destroyer go through there, and we had our Secretary of Defense land on a carrier in that zone to try to keep our flag out there. So we've got all three of these simultaneously. If I were to give any advice on this, I'd say, China, we have to engage and try to keep this stable. Russia, we have to block, and that means forcefully block. But ISIS, we have to destroy them. We just have to defeat them. How do you do that? I think we make that the clear goal that we're going to eliminate them. I think President Obama is inching there. You know, he went to the Pentagon today, gave a press conference from the Pentagon, very rare for him. He still hasn't added new steps. I think we should put everything on the table and say, what will it take? Bombing, will it take ground troops? Will it take an alliance with other countries? Will it take supporting the Kurds more and directly with weapons there? whatever it will take to go after them. Are, are we not asking, though, and this, I'm mm -hmm. taking the critic side here yeah. by saying, uh, you're just asking for a protracted war. If you send ground troops in there, good luck, fella. Yeah, but look what's happened in the last three and a half years. We had the opportunity over the three years as the Syrian crisis went from, say, a few thousand people being killed to over 300,000 people being killed. The whole destruction of the state, probably irreparably now, the elimination of any real border between Iraq and Syria, the rise of the Islamic State wasn't there a few years ago. This is relatively new. And all of this has happened from failing to grapple with that, and this is going to continue to metastasize a Sunni-Shia conflict in the Middle East, a, a dictator-terrorist conflict in the Middle East, and it is touching, as we talked about, it's touching Europe directly, it's going to be touching us. These the shootings in San Bernardino, it wasn't ISIS-directed, perhaps, certainly ISIS-inspired. Yes. Um, you mentioned working with our allies and working with other forces uh, to get rid of ISIS. Let's talk about it. So give me a, a, mm -hmm. a capsule summary here of some of the players. Yeah. Russia in this fight. Right. Russia is pursuing its own interests very clearly. And that interest at the moment is to have Assad in power and a Russian military footprint in Syria, naval and air, which they've got, and to show off their military capabilities. They've done things like launch cruise missiles from a submarine. As, you know, They didn't need to do that, but they wanted to show that they can, and that's sending a message to others in Europe and elsewhere. And they're very happy to go after, first, the U.S.-supported rebels in Syria so that they create a binary choice between Assad or ISIS, so we have to go against ISIS. And that will be the way that he keeps them in power. So Russia becomes an ally of Iran, an ally of Assad, and a big player in the Middle East region. Iran's place in all this. Iran is Shia uh, uh, theocracy, closely tied to the Shia Assad government in Syria and to the Shia Hezbollah movement coming out of Lebanon. They have moved Hezbollah up into Syria to help Assad defend the swaths of territory that he can. And they're very committed to keeping Assad in power and to keeping that Shia hold in the Middle East. And they've opened the other front in Yemen on the Arabian Peninsula, supporting a Shia uh, fighting force there that the Saudis are fighting against. What is the Saudi influence in all this? Uh, Saudi Arabia's got a whole lot of things going on. One of them is they want to block the Shia Iranian influence. That's one. Mm -hmm. Second, they're worried about Iran now on a path to getting a nuclear weapon. They're going to be thinking about, do they need to get a nuclear weapon? Um, they have supported extremist ideology and let that spread throughout the Middle East as a way of keeping it out of their own country to the degree they can. They're, they're exporting it. Well, they're sow the whirlwind and uh, sow the wind and reap the whirlwind, and that's what's happening now. In Syria, they were supporting just about any group that would take the support to fight against Assad. Uh, that included al-Nusra and some other bad actors. They have now started to, again, see the effects of this and ratcheted back and tried to rechannel some of that support. With that in mind, the U.S. relationship with Saudi Arabia, and how can you fight ISIS? Can you fight ISIS and not fight Saudi Arabia? Right. This has gone from bad to worse to worse to worse. And we now have multiple conflicts going on. We've got the Sunni-Shia conflict. We've got the moderate Sunni terrorist Sunni. We've got the dictator terrorist. We've got regional powers. We've got global powers. The only way this settles again is if you're going to have states that govern. And you work with these states to try to create some security and stability. And then we've got to work on that then leading to opportunities for people so it gives people alternatives to, to extremism to oppose governments, which is how we got into this. Uh, that is a tall order, but at this stage it has gotten so bad 
that we can't afford to let the conflicts rage and to let groups like ISIS or al-Nusra or ISIS, which has affiliates in Libya and Afghanistan, to continue to spread. We've got to stop that. Real quickly, one last country. Turkey's place in all this. Turkey, Sunni Arab, they have a problem with Kurdish terrorism inside Turkey, but they have a great relationship with Iraqi Kurds right next door. They're worried about what happens in a chaotic Syria. They want to see Assad go because they believe, and I think the Turks are right about this, if Assad stays in power, the civil war continues because the Sunnis won't ever settle for that. So they're trying to push back against Assad staying in power. That puts Turkey and Russia in, in direct conflict over goals. I don't think they're going to have a war over this. It's all about Syria, but their goals are diametrically opposed now. And we talked about U.S. influence over there, U.S. foreign policy. Uh, much is being made of a certain presidential candidate suggesting a complete, quote unquote, complete shutdown of Muslims entering the U.S., uh, a ban on Muslims, killing militants and their families. Donald Trump's comments, do they affect America's image, prestige, impact around the world? I think it's too hard to answer that right now, to be honest. Uh, clearly, they're out, to my view, they're outrageous comments because Muslims are our allies in much of this as well. The King of Jordan can't come here because he's a Muslim. He's the one, you know, he got in a fighter aircraft himself to go bomb ISIS. So, you know, I think we have to differentiate a little bit here. It's not about a person's identity based on a religion. It's about their behavior. And, and certainly, we have a lot of allies in the Muslim world. Uh, that said, there is a perception of American weakness out there. And I think that Trump, while people will have huge problems with what he is saying, they may also see someone who's going to bring American strength back to the table in some places that's desired. So I don't really know how that plays outside. So the people don't, braggadocio then may work in other parts well, of the country? Well, put it this way. Um, people are tired of or, or afraid of a United States that has pulled back too much from the world. They don't know what Donald Trump would be, and they're very afraid of what he would actually do. But the stirrings of U.S. re-engagement, I think, are things that they would welcome. They just hope it would be someone who's sane at the steering wheel. <laughs> All right. Before you go, we only got a minute or two left here. Uh, climate, 195 countries come to climate talk agreements. I mean, the last time around was Copenhagen back in, what, 2009 or eight or whenever that was. Mm -hmm. That was a complete disaster. Yeah. What changed? Uh, what changed is the framework. Uh, what we were trying to do, or what the governments were trying to do at Copenhagen, was to have legally binding framework for cutting greenhouse gas emissions where everybody would be obliged to perform. What Paris did instead is voluntary uh, quotas. Every country comes forward with what it is willing to do, and you accumulate all of that. The U.S. put forward a figure of 26 to 28 percent reduction by 2030. Others have come forward with other things. China can, it came forward with its targets that it wants to hit by 2030. And then people update their plans as time progresses and they see what more they can do. And the idea is that instead of something that was going to fail, such as Copenhagen did, this is something that can succeed because countries are voluntarily taking it on. I think it still raises a lot of questions about what actually happens. Uh, how do you measure this stuff accurately? How do you know countries are doing what they said they would do? There's a provision that if there's money transferred from developed countries to developing countries that um, they will cut even more. How do you know that that actually has that effect? So I think there's a lot of questions yet to be answered in the implementation. But it's still encouraging to see that many countries come together it and is. agree on just It is, about because it's a, it's a reversal from where we were. And I think it was wise to change the framework, because it was never going to work the way it was teed up before. Ambassador Kurt Volker, always a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for joining <laughs> Thank us. Thank you. In tonight's edition of Arizona Education, we focus on efforts to get more Native American students into college. We begin with producer Christina Estes and photographer Langston Fields introducing us to an ASU student who is on the road to success. Marlena Peschlakai is the first to admit she has changed. Over the years I've grown, as I've seen myself grown as an individual, and I've also had some recent encounters where people are like, oh my God, you've changed. Like, I remembered you just as a freshman, you were just shy, and you didn't really want to talk. Before coming to ASU, population 80,000, Marlena spent her life in Shiprock, New Mexico, population 8,000. I lived in a very rural area, and I grew up when I was little without um, running water and electricity until I was um, a sophomore in high school. That's when I actually got running hot water and electricity. So. For me, um, adjusting like to a very, 
busy city in Phoenix, it was really hard for me because I wasn't used to all the noise and just it being so busy. So it was a lot of adjustment for me. She was a little more prepared thanks to ASU's American Indian Student Support Services. Before her freshman year, Marlena spent a couple weeks on campus. And it was really helpful because I actually got to meet um, other Native American students and it created like a bond and friendship. To this day, we still all talk to each other. Hi, Vicki. Marlena also credits Vicki Baldwin, her ASU mentor. So we're definitely going to be needing performers for that. Over the past four years, Vicki has offered advice and encouragement. So are you going to be applying for the AIS scholarship again? Coming to from a high school that was primarily just Navajos there, like it was really a big adjustment for me going to a very diverse type of setting. Marlena has shared her story with younger students across Arizona. As part of the Tribal Nations tour, she and other ASU students visited schools to promote the college experience. You know, it was surprising because some kids, like at the end of the, our presentations, they would actually come up to us and like some of them actually cried and they were telling us like, I'm going through the same thing. And they, for them, it was kind of like an empowering moment because they knew that it was really possible for them. Marlena never thought she would end up in the nation's capital, but that's where she landed for two months while interning with the Social Security Administration. It was a really life-changing experience, if, especially adjusting from like the West Coast to the East Coast. And I actually got to work on a presentation for the executive directors there. So that was a really, it was a really great moment. And one of the direct directors actually approached me and after my presentation, like she told me, I didn't know if she was like one of the executive directors. And she told me that I was a well-spoken person and like it really made me think like, wow, like I've come so far and um, like with everything that I've been through, um, that I am able to do what I set my mind to and that I can, if I just keep pushing myself and believing in myself that I'm able to do anything I wanna do. Marlena will graduate this spring with a degree in health education and health promotion. She wants to attend graduate school and work with tribal communities to help lower the rate of diabetes. Here with more on efforts to improve American Indian involvement in higher education is Brian McKinley Jones Brayboy, ASU President's Professor of Indigenous Education and Justice and a Director of the Center for Indian Education. And Jacob Moore, ASU Assistant Vice President for Tribal Relations. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Uh, challenges facing American Indian higher education students, what are they? Well, the research really says that there are four primary issues. One is lack of finances, the cost of, of college. There's an issue around lack of role models. How many teachers are there at institutions of higher education who are American Indian students? There's a um, lack of academic preparation, which continues to be an issue. What's happening in the K-12 environments? And then the fourth is really around cultural incongruities, or what's the difference between where students live and then coming to an institution, particularly the size of, of ASU. How do they make that transition? What do you see as far as challenges and the concerns you hear, not only from students, but from parents? You know, it's, it's quite a transition, and particularly if they're coming from a rural community. We live in a state that has 22 tribal nations scattered throughout the state, from every corner of the state, and some of them are extremely remote in rural communities. The, the cultural differences, um, they are sovereign nation, tribal nations, and so I think coming to the university brings a whole set of different circumstances. And um, obviously they think parents are encouraged to send their students to get a higher education that is a pathway to success, but also means that they're participating in a system that isn't necessarily where they came from. And so there are there is this transition and this need for us to provide that additional support. What, what kind of support do you offer? So the support that we offer, um, we have American Indian Student Support Services that basically offers um, uh, wraparound services, being able to ensure that they have a, a place where they feel comfortable. The university can be pretty intimidating uh, for any student uh, as a result of the size of the university. Um, so I think it's an opportunity for us to be able to make them feel a little bit more at home and give them that kind of support that they need. I would imagine something as simple as just making connections when you get on campus. That's huge. It's crucial. I mean, I think that if you look at the research on higher ed for all students, but especially for Native students, fundamentally it's about good relationships. How do you, how do you connect? In this piece that we just saw with Ms. Peshlakai, 
her connection with Vicki Baldwin at American Indian Student Support Service is one of those things that you can begin to tie to those notions of success. So if you have good relationships between students and staff or faculty, even good relationships with each other, we see positive results. Where those, when we don't see positive relationships, often students are leaving the institution. The, and, and I would imagine, again, with all students, but for kids who may see a cultural challenge here, first time away from home, that's got to be big too. I think it's tremendous and I, one of the programs that we offer that American Indian Student Support Services has is a bridge program in the summer. So students come two weeks early, they get their course schedules, they learn how to use their meal plans, they move into the dorm rooms that they're going to use, they make friends, they begin to make the transition so that when they start school they're able to focus on their schoolwork rather than on some of those social and structural constraints. Do you hear that there's pressure, be, do some of these kids feel pressure, whether it's deserved or not, th th to represent their community, that they've got a lot of other folks kind of watching them and rooting for them and they feel pressure from that? Sure, absolutely. In fact, you know, a lot of them are some of the very few that made it that far. If you look at the, the statistics in terms of those that started eighth grade together, those that graduate from high school is about 60% and those that move on to some form of higher education. Uh, the, the research that Dr. Brayboy has done is about 21% that go on to some form of higher education. And those that graduate with an undergraduate degree is anywhere from about two to 7% of that original class that started eighth grade together. So yeah. tremendous pressure, but also grit, I think is you know, one of the things that we see in the, that these students are able to succeed. And a lot of it also is based on the, the concept of reciprocity that they're very uh, connected to wanting to come home. A uh, majority of the students have some expectation that they want to get their education and return back to the community and provide a service, and so that's a lot of pressure. Hey, it sure, it, yeah. do you see that as well? I mean, the idea of uh, I'm here, I'm, I'm doing my work, but home is still probably more home than it is for the average ASU student. Absolutely, and I think that part of this issue is that there's some pressure, but there's also a real sense of responsibility. So part of what the research shows, which I think is really interesting, is for those American Indian students who are successful in higher ed, they often report that they have a, a commitment to their communities, to their tribal nations, to larger community. When they finish, we find that they're deeply engaged, not just in their own community, but actually in larger society. Let's talk about the commitment of the community to these kids. You referred to K-12 education concerns earlier. What needs to be done? What reforms have to happen? Well, I think we have to do a number of things. One is I think we have to take a pretty close look at, at how we're looking at whether or not students are successful or not. I think one of the ways that ASU potentially plays into this and other institutions of higher education is how are we preparing teachers to work with communities. There since, seems to be a problem if you look at the numbers that Jacob mentioned earlier, I think that we have very few students actually going to college. We actually need more native teachers who are from that place, who understand the lives of students so that they can help work through that. So I think structurally we've got to think about who our teachers are and then begin to think about what's the role of school in, in imagining futures for students. So I think we have a little bit of work to do to say education is actually a really good thing and helps build nations in particular kinds of ways. How do you see that as well? K through 12, getting them graduated from high school and perhaps into college and then graduated from higher education. I mean, what improvements need to be made? You know, it, it is a pipeline, you know, it's a system that starts with early childhood into K through 12, into higher education, and many of it, much of it I think is about relevancy. You know, I served on the State Board of Education for eight years, and uh, we do see the challenges that we have in our tribal communities, and a lot of it is based on standards. Uh, part of the question is by whose standards? You know, if, if they come from tribal communities, they come from perhaps a different understanding. You know, we take for granted the idea of, uh, of uh, uh, the, uh, cultural competency within our own communities that's taken for granted in the mainstream, but that might be different coming from a student from a, a different community. And so how do we create relevancy within the curriculum, having teachers that you know represent their communities, having role models? Uh, but more importantly, I think in the long run, it's what's good for our tribal communities is also good for the state. And we do want to give uh, President Crow credit for uh, the amount of support that we're getting to our students because we know that if they're successful, not only are their tribal communities successful, but the state is successful as well.
All right. Well, it sounds like good things are happening. Improvements are being made. Good to have you both here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Tuesday on Arizona Horizon, hear about a new initiative to improve vision screening for the state's children. And best-selling author James Rollins joins us to discuss his new book. That's at 5.30 and 10 on the next Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Helios Education Foundation is proud to underwrite Arizona Education, a 12-month series highlighting the issues affecting college and career readiness of our students. Through a decade of strategic partnerships, Helios is working to change lives and strengthen communities through education.